morning, OCC. What a beautiful Sunday it is. Let's stand together and worship. When we magnify the Lord, he comes and speaks to our hearts. So God, we just lift you high in this place. Be exalted today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Just come and have your way, Lord. We welcome you in our hearts. We turn our eyes towards you.
and we sing that over our, our lives and our hearts today. Let's lift it up. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. thing to know the character of our God. We serve a faithful Father, a promise-keeping God. Maybe you've been praying and believing for something and you haven't seen it yet. I just believe that the Lord wants to come and breathe just fresh help all across this room into hearts today. If that's you and you just want to lift your hands and surrender. God, we just invite you into this moment, Lord. I thank you for the gift of worship. It teaches us how to remind our souls and our spirits of the truth. And these words that we, that we sing over ourselves, over our families, over our lives, and straight to you, God. of your people. You are enthroned on the praises of your people, Lord. You meet us face to face. So we just quiet our hearts before you now, Lord. We lay everything at your feet. We love you. Jesus. May we, may we always live from that place of love where we are hungry for more of you. Let us not ever grow familiar with coming, coming to meet with you, God. We're not satisfied with where we've been. Take us deeper, Lord. Take us deeper. It is in the holy and the mighty name of Jesus that we all said, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. 
Good morning. My name is Shane. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Owensboro Christian Church, and we are so excited that you are here with us this morning. Uh, wanted to uh, just say, I, I kind of feel like Mr. Rogers this morning because it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Can I get an amen to that? The weather is finally getting warmer, and man, it is awesome. So yeah, I didn't think we were ever going to make it through the cold and the rainy, but here we are in mid-April with some good weather. So that is something to celebrate uh, together. Also wanted to celebrate with you uh, what happened just yesterday morning as a church. We partnered with four other local churches uh, in, a, in a thing called Serve the Borough, and we uh, took church outside of these walls and went and served our community together. Tons of you were involved in that. There were 12 different sites. We're going to highlight that a little bit more next week with a video, but we just wanted to start out by saying thank you for partnering with us in that way. It was certainly a great morning of serving together as a body. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of bring your attention to this morning is something that we do every May at the end of the school year. Each year we have seniors that graduate from high school and from college, and we want to celebrate them together as a family here on Saturday and on Sundays. And so there's going to be a little video collaboration as part of this senior celebration and also a gift that we'll give to each senior, just like we do every year to kind of give them some resources and to, to congratulate them on their achievements and to get them set for the next season of life. But to be able to do all of that, we need your help. If you know a senior, you love a senior, uh, you're related to a senior graduating, again, either high school or college, if you could just direct them to our website, that would be awesome. There's just a little question there uh, for them to fill out to give us some information about what their future plans are and their college major or their place of uh, work in the future, all that kind of thing, as well as some pictures. So for the grandmas in the room, they can ooh and ah over the baby pictures and the graduation pictures. All of that comes through that questionnaire. It takes just about two or three minutes to fill out, but we do need that information to be able to celebrate the seniors in the room well. Um, so if you wouldn't mind helping us with that, that would be fantastic. Uh, one last thing I want to say is thank Thank you for what you give to make ministry here at Owensboro Christian possible. Those gifts that we give seniors, the ministry that we do through Serve the Borough, all of those things flow from the, the money that you give to make that ministry happen. And so if you've been giving faithfully for a long time, we want to say thank you. And if you're looking for a way to maybe give for the first time in a while uh, or the first time ever, there's little black boxes around the outside of the room, or you can go online to the app or the website. So if you're watching on TV uh, or online today, you can give that way as well. And again, we say thank you for all of that. Okay, at this time, we're going to turn our attention to the talk. Scott is going to come and bring a word from Colossians chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and open in your Bibles there, that would be fantastic as you direct your attention to the screens to check out the video behind me. I was uh, one of those days where I have a, a meeting after church. We've got a meeting for those who are going to Israel this summer, and so I've been running around trying to get just a few things in order, a couple things that I had uh, forgotten prior, so Sarah was picking something up for me. I went to text her the word either, like she asked, you want this or that? I said either, and it auto-corrected just now to the Eurythmics. Um, <laughs> the Eurythmics is what came out, so I... I don't know what kind of morning you've been having. That kind of sums up my morning today. So I, I hope your morning has been smoother and uh, more normal than mine has been. But we're just glad that you are, are here. And if this is one of the first few handful of times that you've been with us, and you and I have never had a chance to meet, my name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors on staff. I would love to, to meet you after the service if we haven't had the opportunity to do so. And I want to greet those who are with us online or on television. We're glad that you're tuning in with us today uh, as well. I want to start today with these uh, words, if you would listen to these. If I win this tournament, it will change my life on the golf course, but it won't change my life at home. Winning isn't going to satisfy my soul or my heart. I know that going in, so I'm able to play freely knowing that the rest really isn't up to me. I'm just going to do my best. 
Uh, those were the words of Scotty Scheffler written on a note card the morning of Sunday, April 10th, just a few hours before he went on to win the, the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, just eight weeks prior to his victory, Scheffler had been a relatively unknown 25-year-old. He was beginning his third season on the PGA Tour, still seeking his first PGA victory, actually. He had never won a PGA event. And then in the span of eight weeks, he won four of the six tournaments that he entered, and he went to the number one ranked golfer in the world. About as steep of trajectory as you could possibly get. The type of thing you might believe would go to somebody's head. And yet, in an interview after his victory at Augusta, he explained, my identity isn't a golf score. Like Meredith, his wife, told me this morning, if you win this golf tournament today, if you lose this golf tournament by 10 shots, if you never win another golf tournament again, I'm still going to love you. You're still going to be the same person. Jesus loves you and nothing changes. Now, uh, Scheffler's note card and his wife's words and really his whole press conference afterward, it generated uh, a decent amount of buzz in the mainstream media and on social media. It seemed to encourage some people, resonated with some, confused uh, maybe a, a few others. And you might be tempted to say, well, those words are sweet and great, but, you know, it's, it's golf, right? Like, it, it's a game, you know, what does it matter? You take a, there's a little ball and a stick and you're trying to hit it and it's really difficult. Like, what, what difference does this make? But the truth is, from a Bible's perspective, the same values that guided Scheffler from professional obscurity through a master's victory are the same values that can and should guide us through the highs and lows of our work. And it doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter if you're a banker, business owner, stay-at-home parent, teacher, electrician, accountant, factory worker, you know, chef, like whatever it is, listen to the words of scripture. Colossians chapter 3. Shane invited you to turn there just a moment ago. We're going to read verse 17 and then verses 23 through 24. And I want to invite you to stand as we read this, not only because these are going to be, um, this is the text for our message today, but because the, this scripture is going to guide uh, the next few weeks of our time together. Colossians 3.17. This is written by a man named Paul. He was an early church planner and leader. He writes to a church in a city called Colossae, which is why the book's called Colossians. And he says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He goes on to talk about wives in relationship to husbands and husbands to wives and children to parents parents to children, employers to employees. And then he says in verse 23 again, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. It's the word of the Lord, amen? You may have a seat. Today we're beginning a new teaching series. It's just three weeks long called Whatever You Do. We're talking about why work matters, why it's an important part of our lives, why work can cause us so much misery from time to time, and ultimately, the good God can do through what you do. Now, I'll talk about this more throughout the morning and really throughout the next few weeks, but in this series, by work, I mean more than a job. For many of us, paid employment is a large part of the work that we do, but it's, it's not the only work that you do. And not all work is a job. For example, I'll give you just a couple examples. Caring for your children is work, right? Can I get, a, can I get an amen to this? La last hour, I was walking through the, the, the lobby. Uh, worship had just begun, and there was a dad carrying a uh, crying child and also like a diaper-changing station and I, like a little pad, and I just thought, work? I told you, like, this is... This is work. Same thing, going to school is work. It's not the same thing as a career, but it is certainly work. Competing on a team, keeping up your property, uh, serving on a board of a nonprofit, like volunteering at church, all of these are different forms of work. And the thing is, you will struggle to find a meaningful life without some form of work. But it is a serious mistake to view work as the meaning of life. The Bible's perspective, what it invites us to do is to see the beauty and purpose that God has ordained behind work, his, his reason for it, but to also um, see the limits to what work can bring. Because if, if, we, uh, if we keep work in its proper place and it's a means of our worship, like we'll thrive. 
But if work becomes the object of our worship, like our heart is really drawing after that, like that's when we really find ourselves in some difficult places. We'll struggle. And oftentimes, busyness of life and uh, expectations of bosses and even our own personal desires can cause us to get those things a little bit flipped. And so we want in this series to, to put work in its proper perspective, which for some of us may mean to elevate the importance of work. Maybe you're not giving your best at what it is you've been have to, to do. For some of us, it might be lowering a little bit work, not giving a less effort, but not seeing it so much as um, our only source of identity any longer. Like we, we could be all over the map in this. So what I wanna do to begin, I just wanna pray over you, your family, our church, that we would, in these next few weeks, get a vision for what God has for us in regards to what we offer him in our life, um, through our work, and then we'll continue in. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the different gifts that you've given us, for the different opportunities that you've given us, um, for the jobs that you've given us, although work is bigger than a job. And Lord, I'm sure today uh, there are folks who love what they do, I'm sure there are folks listening who hate what they do. I'm sure there are some considering making a shift in what they do, maybe changing jobs or careers. Um, there are some who perhaps are retired and think, oh, this has nothing to do with me, and yet it, it does because work is so much bigger than paid employment. Lord, I pray for all of us. We would get um, a vision that you have, um, that you would give us of what work means, what it is, why it matters, and how we can do it well. And I pray you're pleased in our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a, in a book called No Man is an Island, Thomas Merton, a Catholic author, writes this. He says, all vocations are intended by God to manifest his love in the world. The difference between the various vocations lies in the different ways in which each one enables people to discover God's love, appreciate it, respond to it, and share it with others. Uh, I love that Merton quote because it sets us up really well for where we're headed these next few weeks. But he uses a word in it that we all really know what it means, but it's not a word that we use frequently, and that's the word vocation. We, we tend to use the word job or the word um, employment or the word career. The English word vocation actually comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call or, or to summon. And Christians are a group of people who are known at times to talk about their calling in life, like God has called them to a particular type of work, or he's called them to a specific task, or called them to a type of community. And although career can be an aspect of our calling, the calling God puts on our life, these, these two words are not synonymous. For many people, paid work will never be their most important vocation. For some of us, it might be, but for many, unpaid work, the unpaid work you do in the context of your family, or the context of a community, or even within a, a church, may be equally or even more important to the paid work that you do. And the truth is, though, all of it, whatever you do, is part of our worship. As Merton says, it manifests God's love in the world. And so what I want to do as we get started, I want to give kind of a 30,000 foot over, just really a quick broad stroke, about how it is that we have possibly lost the vision that God has for work. And then we're gonna go back to this Colossians 3 passage and talk about um, some of the truths that it gives us. Perhaps how we've lost the vision for what God intends work to be. In the first three centuries of the church, it was believed that all Christians had a call to discipleship. And people define discipleship in a lot of different ways, but for our purposes this morning, discipleship is learning to live your life as if Jesus were living it through you. And what that means is to be a disciple of Jesus, to follow him, you don't have to become an itinerant preacher who's walking around and healing people and feeding, you know, feeding people and preaching sermons. What it means is your gifts, your personality, your education, your sphere of influence, like if Jesus was living your life, like you're learning to live more and more in that way. If Jesus was living his life through you, like that's what a disciple learns to to do, And then this discipleship that all Christians knew they were called to in those early days of the church, they knew it impacted the entirety of their lives, including their work, and that their calling in life, whatever that calling might be, would likely involve some form of suffering. We see this hinted at in passages throughout the New Testament. I'll give you one as an example. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 12, uh, says this. If I can find it, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He says, like, this is not a strange thing, 
but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Not, share, not strange to suffer. Rejoice as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you were insulted for the name of Christ, you were blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And then he concludes the section in verse 19 saying, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now at the time, suffering for your faith was, was pretty much inevitable. Like if you were a Christian, Christianity was this small um, kind of religious sect, like it was a small population, small part of the, the um, community, and the overall population. Like all of that though started to change the them as a minority group, the suffering that came along with it, it all started to change with the conversion of Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine, around AD 300. So we're about 275 years after the birth of Jesus, you know, or 300 years after the birth of Jesus, sorry, and about 275 years or so after his, his resurrection from the grave. Constantine converts to Christianity. All of a sudden, Christianity becomes the legal religion of the Roman Empire, and the church moves from the margins of society towards the mainstream. And one of the things that does is it paves the way for what we might consider special religious callings, like special religious professions that people might pursue. After Constantine, being, being a Christian no longer required the type of suffering that it had before. You still at times might suffer for your faith if you um, really stuck your neck out for Jesus or you're in a difficult moment and you were trying to be faithful and someone else wasn't. Like You still may suffer, but it was no longer inevitable. Christianity was more and more of a common thing. And so if you really wanted to suffer for Jesus and if you wanted to prove how much you loved him and be almost like kind of this super spiritual person, well, you, be you became a monk. Or you became a priest or a nun or a friar. And that was, your, that was a way, at least, to show your true devotion. And over time, these kind of special religious callings became more and more codified. They became more and more normal, more and more um, accepted as this unique calling someone gives to like, a special person. And then everyone else kind of has a different type of calling. Well, the reformer Martin Luther, who himself was a monk became determined to, to break the church free from this idea of special religious callings and instead return the church to the biblical conviction that every believer has a part to play in the mission of God. Everybody has an important part to play. And he did this by teaching simply the gospel, salvation by grace through faith. So if, if you're letting go of the motivation to prove or to earn your salvation by what you do, you're trusting in what Jesus has done. And if you've let go of the motivation to prove your spirituality through some kind of special religious career, well, then what the gospel does is it, it eliminates distinctions between jobs as like some are holy and important and some are unholy and unimportant. One author explained it this way. He said, at the core of Luther's Reformation, is a radical equalization of all Christians as disciples of Jesus Christ who are now called to serve their neighbors through and according to their gifts, talents, abilities, and resources. This is just what Merton said uh, a little bit ago. All vocations are intended by God to manifest his love in the world. And the only difference really is like how exactly that happens. In short, like I may be called to serve as a, as a pastor. We have other pastors on staff who are called to serve, but they, they, they don't, they're not wired the same way I am. They don't, I don't have the same gifts as them. They don't necessarily have the same gifts as me. And so some, some are called to serve as a pastor. That's a unique role and function within the church. But, but there's nothing about my job that makes me more holy or better than anybody else. There, there's nothing about um, my work that's more important than yours. Like, it's just different, right? It's, it's not better or worse. It's, it's, it's different. You have your own gifts, your own experiences, education, spheres of influence that uniquely equip you to serve others in Jesus' name in a way that, that I or many others never could do so. So Colossians gives us a really helpful, really helpful language and perspective when it says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord Jesus you will receive the inheritance as your reward you are serving the Lord Christ. 
So what this Colossians passage does, it really, it does three things. It expands our vision for work and what God intends work to be. It reframes who our audience is that we're really serving when we do our work. And then finally, it it points to a more substantial reward than simply getting a paycheck or having a really good retirement plan. And so I want to use those kind of three things as the outline for the rest of our message. The first, that Colossians 3 expands our vision for what God intends with our, with our work. The, the Greek word church, ecclesia, means an assembly or a gathering. That's what the word meant. And so when we, when we gather together like this on the weekend, we set aside part of, the, part of our week um, to gather with like-minded believers or to gather with people who are, who are seeking out truth in their, their faith. Like we're, we're functioning as the church. We've, we've all assembled to connect with God, connect with each other, Worship God, give him the due that he deserves to worship, and receive from him in his word. Like, that's part of the church's function. But the church also, if you take that word and you break it down, it means the called out ones, those who are called out to live differently in this world, to be a light in what is sometimes a dark place. And in that way, we're just as much the church Monday through Friday when all our members are dispersed through fields and homes and schools and offices and factories, we're just as much the church then when we're bearing the name of Christ in every corner of our community and corner of the world. Like your work is, is just as much as a, as a calling, just as, as important as mine or anyone else's. And there was a, there was a man named Leslie Newbegin who, who wrote a lot about this. And how he stumbled into this topic even was a little unique. He served as a missionary for, for 40 years in India. He was from Britain. And he served as a missionary, which sometimes today we would consider one of those like special religious callings, like you're going to serve as a missionary. Well, that's what he did for 40 years. And when he came back to Britain, he wrote about how the church needed to become appointing people. It was for appointing people. And what he said and argued was that, hey, we reached a point when, when people are no longer going to don the doors of your church simply because you're open, or simply because you have a sign out front. He's writing in like the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That was his main time that he wrote. So this is, this is decades uh, ago. But he's saying people aren't just gonna come just because your doors are open. If we wanna lead people to Jesus and help them enter into the kingdom of God, like well, we need to point people to Jesus with every aspect of our lives. And he believed one of the best ways we did that was through our work. And so he wrote a lot about what it meant to be appointing people through your um, career, through your work. And I'll give you just one uh, excerpt of what he said. He said, the farmer who tends his land well, but neglects to say his prayers or serve on a church committee, might be condemned by some for failing his duty to the church. And maybe, maybe you felt that at some point. Maybe you are a farmer. You've got crazy hours, early mornings, late nights. Maybe you've got another vocation or career that um, is very much the same. It's very inconsistent. And your work, you work a lot. And, and you've, been, uh, you've either been looked down upon or you've been made to feel or you've just felt lesser because you're like, I'm, I'm doing this work and I think it's important, but I, I haven't been able to be part of this committee or I haven't been able to serve in this way. I wasn't able to serve, serve the borough because I was working my regular job. And you've almost felt like, I'm, I feel almost like a second rate you know, church member because of what I'm having to do over here. But, but Newbegin actually argued the opposite. He said, there's this farmer who feels bad because he's working hard, but he can't serve on the church committee. But then he said this, but the farmer who says his prayers and serves on the committee while allowing weeds and bad drainage and soil erosion to spoil his land is failing his duty to Christ. Not just the church, but to Christ. His primary ministry in the total life of the body of Christ is to care rightly for the land entrusted to him If he fails there, he fails in his primary Christian task. Now, what Newbegin is saying is that our work is a means, maybe maybe even the primary means of our worship and our witness. Our work is a means of our worship and our witness. How How you take care of what you've been entrusted says a lot about what you believe of God. And it says something to the world around you about who your God is. That's why it's a means of our worship and our witness. And so Colossians 3 is really expanding our vision of what work is. It's not just checking in in the paycheck or so we can afford to go on vacation. Like it's it's our way of worship. It's our way of telling others who God is like. And that really really matters. Second, 
Colossians 3 reframes the audience of who it is we're called to serve. Paul says, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You were serving the Lord Christ. Who are, who are you serving? He says, Christ. You're not serving primarily your boss, your employees, your, your peers, your clients, your board, you know, your investors. Like for the Christian, all those things are important. Like they matter. But they come secondarily to serving Jesus. And the truth is, if you are truly serving Jesus with your life, whatever it is that you do, you will be a better boss. You will be a better employee. You'll be a better steward of the things that have been given to you because you're putting him first and making serving him uh, primary in your life. i give you an illustration of, of how this works and why it matters. One of the best parenting tips or advice that Sarah and I ever received was to uh, make sure the love for our children came secondarily to the love that we have for one another as husband and wife. That, that our kids would always know that mom and dad love each other, were committed to one another, and that that would actually, that would help them thrive. Because it's the, it's the love of the husband and wife that creates this little life to begin with. And so when parental love remains strong, you offer a sense of foundation, a sense of grounding. Like Ezra needs to know that I love Sarah, and he can't weasel his way in between them, however hard he might you know, try to do it from time to time. And like that offers him security and peace. And this was driven home for me just, just last week. We had, we had someone come and do some painting at our house because, uh, you know, baby two is 10 weeks away. Yeesh, 10 weeks. Uh, and um, so he's moving rooms. He's, he's shifting from the room he's been in for almost four years and he's moving to what had been my office, you know, kind of a nice quiet space where I could do some work. I don't know where I'm gonna do that now, but uh, he's moving in there. He got to choose the color of his room. He chose blue. We got to pick the shade, but he got to pick the color. And so, so his new room was getting painted. We had a, a guest bedroom that we think a lot of in-laws are probably gonna be coming. So, um, so we painted that fresh. And then our master bath, I don't, I don't know when they painted that, but like it needed repainted. So um, like three, three and a half rooms that were gonna be repainted. And uh, it was gonna be a day, day and a half job to get it done. And so I, I came home for lunch on the first day and I wanted to take Ezra up to see it. So I took him up there and you know, there are mirrors off the walls and all our bathroom stuff laying out and beds are pushed to the middle of rooms and just the whole upstairs is fairly chaotic. And I, I picked him up because I didn't want him to get in the stuff. And it's like, hey, look at this, look at that. And I could tell his body was just tense. And he was looking around and he said, he whispered to me, he said, I'm ready to go back downstairs. Okay, like surprise, I was surprised. I took him back downstairs and uh, we sat down to make my afternoon pot of coffee. I brew some coffee in the morning and, and drink it. And then I, if I'm home for lunch, I'll brew another pot. I'll pour some in a mug and I'll take it into the office for the afternoon. And so we were sitting watching the, watching the coffee brew because like we know how to have fun in our house. And so, you know, just drip, drip coffee right down. Like it sounds funny, but it's one of his favorite things. So twice a day, like he helps, he could make me a cup of coffee if he needed to. And he makes it, we, we watch it drip down. And sometimes he has to make a full pot just so we can sit there and watch it for a long time. So, um, so we're watching the coffee drip down and and because I had sensed something weird upstairs, I told him, I go, hey, buddy, you know, they'll be done with the painting tomorrow. It'll all be finished by tomorrow. And he looked up at me over his, over his shoulder, and he said, he goes, and then we'll have our home back. Like something, something in his little mind had equated the disorder of a few rooms with the loss of our, of our home. And so I thought, if such a small disturbance in the force can, can, can chip away at his sense of security. It just reinforces that providing an environment where he never doubts mom and dad's love for one another, mom and dad's love for him, is one of the best ways to help him thrive. And in the same way, when your faith in Christ not only guides what you do, but it guides how you do it, so that those who look at you in your place of work or who are connected to your work, they never doubt, have reason to doubt your love for Jesus, well, that'll have a positive impact on the, on the output of what you do, on the morale of the people that you do it with. Uh, this is not to say that you have to walk around your place of business or employment and say, the reason why we do this is because Jesus says, or the Bible says, like, there may be a moment that you say, hey, here's why I value this, and here's why we're going to do something 
this particular way. But like, you don't have to do that all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to walk around every day and share tracks with like the, the people who work with you and, and make sure you share the gospel with someone every single day when you're in the office. I, I hope there are opportunities where you're taking advantage of sharing your faith with somebody and talking about why Jesus matters to you and how he's seen you through a hard time and maybe praying with someone who's going through a hard time. I hope that you take advantage of those. But a lot of what it means to serve Christ first and foremost through our work is, is caught as much as it is taught. It's you being consistent in who you are and, and in your worship from, from the weekend or church involvement all the way through your work. Like you're being consistent in who you are and people begin to, to see that. That's it, serving Christ. Right, serving Christ also means that there's room for grace at work. Right, oftentimes we don't think about grace at work, like work is a place of business. There's room for grace, there, there's freedom to take risks, there's freedom to fail, freedom to make mistakes, there's freedom to apologize when you make a mistake, there's, there's freedom to change jobs or change vocations if you sense God calling you to do so or you just simply desire to do so. Your work, your work is important but it doesn't define you. All right, Christ's love, Christ's grace, that, that is what defines you and so like, Yes, there needs to be accountability at work. Does accountability matter? Absolutely. Does integrity matter? Like, absolutely. I, I am not suggesting at all that, that if you're a Christian, like, you can never fire somebody. Like, you gotta fire somebody at times. But the way that you do that should be informed by your faith. You're serving Jesus even in that moment, right? So it, how you treat the other person as a human being, how you care for them, that might be different. Doesn't mean that we don't do hard work because we value hard work and honest work. But how you go about that is different if you're serving Jesus first and foremost. And so Colossians gives us this broader vision of work. It also reminds us who we're actually serving. And then number three, it points us to a more substantial reward. At one extreme, uh, those of us kind of in the West, Westerners, and maybe, maybe this is true everywhere, but I speak more from uh, our context, kind of see work as a necessary evil. Like work is something that we got to do so you can pay the water bill and you can pay to go to the movies or pay to go to Florida on vacation or what, whatever it is. You're like, I, I hate what I do, but I, but I do it so we can do fun things. And then on the other extreme, you've got folks who, are, who are become so engrossed in their career that it really becomes their identity. All right, it becomes their identity. Char Charles Taylor uh, is a Canadian. He's a Christian. Um, I don't know why I said Canadian first. He's a, he's a Christian. Like, that's the most important thing. He is from Canada, eh? And... Uh, <laughs> He's a philosopher, sociologist, who, who has this theory that Westerners, and he's talking mainly Canadians and Americans, but he says that we've embraced what he calls the authenticity narrative. And, and what he means by that is he sees that the central challenge people feel they have to overcome in their life is the suppression of their individuality. That, that many people today believe if they're not being authentic to what they're feeling in the moment, or if they're not saying exactly what's on their mind in the moment and being authentic to that, well, then that's the greatest possible sin that they can commit. That, that's not, it's not biblical. Uh, that's not always even logical. But, but it's common. that There's a strong desire for people to be individuals and to set themselves apart. And one of the, one of the easiest ways for someone to do that is through their work. And so as a result, work often becomes about the use of my gifts and my personal fulfillment or the fulfilling of my personal vision, this vision that I have of what needs to be done. And so vocation can become about how I brand myself so that I can best leverage my opportunities. And maybe you've seen this in your field or profession. Like everyone out just, to, they're, it's all about image and how I brand myself so that I can leverage this for the best possible results for me. And, and the Bible certainly has a lot to say about enjoying what we do. The Bible speaks about enjoying what we do. The Bible has a lot to say about using the gifts that we've been given. But the Bible presents the purpose of work not as branding ourselves, but as learning to live beyond ourselves. And what that means is what we do with our life isn't just about getting our name out there so we can make the world better for me. What we do with our life is about making the world better for somebody else. Like that's the, that's the meaning and purpose behind our work. Like personal fulfillment, that's great. But it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't always come, come first. And Dorothy Sayers is an author who um, asks some really helpful, I think, probing questions along these lines to help us think about 
work that really matters. I wanted to share a few of the questions that she asked um, with you. I'll give you four questions. She says, we should ask of a career, not is it sexy, but is it good? Like, is this a career? Not that so someone looks at me and goes, man, I really wish I had her career, really wish I could do what he does. Like, I'd love to have that freedom or that ability. Not, not will people look at it and think, oh, I want that, it's sexy. But like, is this good? Is this something good to give my life to? She says we should ask of workers, not how much do they make, but what is their work worth? It's fine to make a good living. It's fine to, it's fine to, to make a lot of money, and I hope if you do, you use it well, and you're generous with what you've, what you've been blessed with. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but it's, it's not always the best thing to say, hey, is, is this a six-figure salary job? But that's not always the most important thing. Sometimes it's, it's good to say, I will take something that gives me significantly less because the value of what I'm doing is so important. So the, the first question is not necessarily, well, how much do they make, but what is the work worth? She says we should ask of goods, not can I get people to buy them, but are these useful things well made? It's not just can we make the cheapest trinket and then get a really good marketing team to come along so people just like gobble it up. Like, can I convince them to buy another phone even though they just bought one nine months ago, like type of thing. But like, am I making something that's, that will last and it's, it's good quality and it's sold at a fair price and like it's actually helping improve people's lives? Are these useful things well made? And she says we should ask of employment, not how much money a week, but will it exercise my faculties to the utmost? Will it take what I've been given, my gifts, what I've trained for, and is it stretching me so that I'm not, I'm not mailing it in, I'm not just sitting around collecting unemployment, like I'm, I'm taking what I've been given and I'm, I'm using it, I'm stretching myself. That's our worship. And we're using it to serve the Lord. Now these questions, I said they're probing, they matter. Based upon, they all matter, based upon your season of life, you may you may kind of prioritize the answer to one over another. Maybe you've got a family responsibility right now that you, you've, you've got to help take care of. You've got an aging parent. Um, you've got a sick spouse or a sick child. And so for you, the most important thing for you in terms of your work is not that you're using every ounce of your creative energy and you're using all your faculties to the utmost. But what's important for you is you can be home at five o'clock so that you can help take care of the people who need your care. Maybe it's important that right now you have a consistent income because of some responsibilities that you have. And so maybe you could possibly make more doing this, but there's greater risk involved. And right now it's, it's responsible for you to do something that is consistent and, and trustworthy. Um, I'll give you an example. It's not hard to imagine a Christian mom or dad who um, is an entrepreneur at heart and loves to start businesses and get them going and grow them and make good money and sell them off and then go do something different as well. And that can, that can honor the Lord, that's a great thing. But it's also, it's very much a self-employed type of life in many cases. And you may reach a season where you go, listen, uh, that's what my passion is, but I've, I've gotta work for a while in the aluminum factory. And there's nothing wrong with working in the aluminum factory, but for this person, maybe it's not their passion, it's not what they imagined they were gonna be doing, but they, they've had a, a son or daughter and they have special needs. And all of a sudden they go, I, I, need, I need a job that has good benefits, I need a job that's gonna get me home at a reliable time, that I can go give a hard day's work, but I know I'm gonna be home. Um, I, I need to do it in a town that's close to family so they can help help offer care, and so all of a sudden, like, you got someone who's limited in location, they wanna be close to family, they're limited in options because they need a job with good health benefits. Like, they may not feel like they're authentic, I can't ever say this word, authenticating themselves through their work. Like, it's not exactly what they dreamed they'd be doing in the moment. They may feel, not feel like they're giving their best at church, they thought they'd volunteer more time, they're not doing as much of that as they thought, but what are they doing? Well, in increasing levels of importance, they're offering a valuable product, they are, serve, they are providing for their family, and they are serving Christ through what they've been given, All right, even if it's not exactly what they would have mapped out or chosen for themselves. And what did Jesus say about using what we've been given? He said, be faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Be faithful with, what, with what's been put before you, and continue with that until something else is put before you. I love what Francis Schaeffer said. He said, in God's sight, there are no little people and there are no little places. Only one thing is important, to be consecrated persons in God's place for us at each moment. Whatever you do, do it for the Lord, knowing that you receive your reward from 
from him. In his post-master's uh, press conference after he had won, Scotty Scheffler said this. He confessed, I cried like a baby this morning. That's not after his victory. That was before the last round. He said, I cried like a baby this morning. I was so stressed out. I didn't know what to do. I was sitting there telling Meredith, I don't think I'm ready for this. I'm not ready for this. I don't feel like I'm up for this type of stuff. I just felt so overwhelmed. She told me, who are you to say that you're not ready? Who are you to say that you know what's best for your life? And so what we talked about is that God is in control and that the Lord is leading me. And if today is my time, it's my time. And if I shot 82 today, which if you're not a golfer, that would be great for us. Uh, but would not be good for someone trying to win the Masters. If I shot 82 today, you know, somehow I was going to use it still for his glory. You are more than your work. You hear me? You are more than your work, but your work is an important part of who you are. God designed it that way. God designed it that way. So rather than seeing work as a God so that it defines every part about our life and we find our identity in it, and rather than seeing it as gain so it's all about collecting a, a paycheck, we would do well to see work as glory. It's our way of bringing glory to God in the world through success or even through failure because failure opens up opportunity to bring God glory as well. The, the truth is your work is not an end, right? Your work is an avenue. And even if the avenue should change because you change careers or you find yourself out of employment for a while or if, um, or if your avenue is taken from you because you're fired or you retire or whatever it might be, your chief end remains. And what is the chief end of man? Well, the Westminster Catechism answered to glorify God and enjoy him forever. When you glorify God and enjoy him through your work, you embody the spirit of Colossians chapter three. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You are serving the Lord Christ. And it's my prayer over these next few weeks, like we, we will re we'll renew our vision for how the work God has given us, paid or unpaid, uh, is part of our worship, is part of our witness. And if we'll do it with that mindset, it will make a real difference in the world. Let me pray that over us this morning. God, we, we thank you again for what it is that you have given each and every person in this room, gifts, talents, abilities. God, help us not to be lazy with those things. Help us not to shirk our responsibilities. Help us to stretch ourselves and to grow in what we can do for others. Help us, though, at the same time, not to make work our God and find our identity in it. Lord, this is, it is a tough um, wire act to walk at times, but Lord, we want to see what we do, paid and unpaid work, as our worship and our witness for you in this world. And I pray that as we do that, you'd give us joy. Even if work is, at work is hard sometimes, help us find joy even in those hard moments. Help us serve you, help us make life better for others, and help us find value in a hard day's work. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to stand with me uh, for a time of response. You know, this is a time, uh, let, let's say it this way. Th today's message is a little, little more narrow in focus because we're, there are a lot of different ways that we work, but we're, we're talking about this specific kind of topic. Maybe you have a prayer need today that isn't really tied into work at all. And if so, that's, that's fine. I, I'd still invite you during this time of response. If you need to bring um, a prayer need before God at the altar and you want to do that, whether it's health related, relationship related, like I'd still invite you to come and bring that before God as we have this time of song. I'll be down here praying, so if you come to pray about something, you're not gonna be by yourself. But I also wanna challenge you today that perhaps if there is something in relation to your work, you're at a crossroads right now about a decision you need to make, um, about what you need to do with an employee, about just an important decision in your profession or career or something at home with your kids, like, and you wanna bring that before God too, this would be a great time to, to do so. And so we're gonna, we're gonna respond to God's word in song, we're gonna respond in prayer, and afterwards we'll take the Lord's Supper together and we'll call it a morning, but would you come as we sing?
love uh, the, the, really the prayer behind that song that um, whatever may come, whatever may befall, like God would be our vision, he'd be our focus, and he would he'd help us navigate and see it through. And, and that's not just, um, it's not just lip service in scripture. Jesus really models that. Jesus and John talks often about completing the work that his father had given him to do, and the way he was able to do that was by Keeping, keeping the Father, his focus, staying connected. And Jesus' most important work, he healed and he taught, and, but was, was becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so he was, because he completed his work, we can know that we're not saved by the work we do, but by the work of Jesus. And we remember that each week. Anyone who's uh, trusted in the grace of Jesus, believes he's the son of God sent to forgive the world. Like we, we we take the bread and the juice and remember Jesus' body and blood. So if you uh, believe these things about Jesus and by grace are walking with him, let's, let's take the bread and break and eat. Remember Jesus' body broken for us. Let's take the juice and drink and remember the blood of Jesus shed for the forgiveness of sin. You can uh, remain standing if you would. We'll dismiss in just a moment. If we can pray for you afterward, we'd love to pray afterwards with you. Um, it, Donnie, if Donnie's somewhere around here too, I'm gonna ask Donnie to come and join me in front because after a few minutes, I'm gonna head towards uh, the Israel meeting. If you're part of that meeting, we're gonna meet in the student room right over here by entrance A, so uh, check that out. If you're new to OCC, just got some questions about our church, we'd love to help answer those at the Welcome Center right here by entrance B. People there who'd love to help you out in any way, so I hope you'll take us up on that. But before we go, let's just have a quick blessing and then we will we'll dismiss. God, we love you this week and whatever we do, help us to do it in a way that honors you. Give us joy in that and help us to be a light for someone else as we worship you through our work. And we pray that you'll keep us safe um, until we gather back together again uh, next week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a great week. God bless. See you next weekend.